with, uh, sorry. Hello, my name is Courtney Raj and I'm in the Senior US and Technology Policy Advisor for Article 19 in the United States. And I'm delighted to be here today uh, at this panel organized on the sidelines of the Summit for Democracy during the Civil Society Forum. We are going to discuss today over the little less than an hour, the intersection of technology and freedom of expression. Specifically, we are looking at how technology and freedom of expression are both great enablers, but also great challenges. So technology is a great enabler of freedom of expression, but it also poses new challenges and amplifies old ones at the scale and scope of communication technologies expand. The dream a decade ago of social media and digital communications heralding a new era of citizen engagement and democratic promise has been shattered by the monopolization of the information system by a handful of platforms whose design and approach has deepened polarization, nurtured extremism, and provided new tools to those in power who would manipulate and control the public sphere. As recognition that self-regulation is insufficient to protect against harms from genocide, to terrorism, to prolific harassment, governments around the world are exploring how to regulate the intermediaries we depend on to express ourselves in the public sphere. We are going to delve into these issues today, talk about the legal approaches being taken by democracies to regulate expression, self-regulatory efforts to combat disinformation and extremism, and rethinking liability and accountability regimes, all in the challenge of protecting freedom of expression for all. What are the trends and the sticking points and how can democracies ensure they protect freedom of expression? We're going to get into this now with our three excellent panelists, Craig Newmark, Vivian Schiller, and Barbara Broska. So Vivian Schiller, you are the director of Aspen Digital and have a storied career in journalism and technology, uh, including as global head of news for Twitter, uh, worked at NPR, New York Times, et cetera. You recently headed up a commission on disinformation, or sorry, a commission on information disorder, and you can explain why we think about it uh, information disorder versus disinformation. Could you tell us about why did we need that commission and what were the main findings? Sure. Uh, so first of all, we called it information disorder rather than the more colloquial myths and disinformation because we wanted to take a more expansive look at the issue, not just the pieces of harmful content, but um, why we are suddenly in a situation in this in the United States and around the world where um, the truth is being uh, evidence-based reality is being um, undermined, whether it's about COVID, climate change, harms to underrepresented communities, elections, democracy, and more. It's a crisis. And so this uh, group came together. Um, and I should say uh, the, the, the work of this group was informed by the global context, but focused on the United States to try to come up to sort of uh, call the best ideas that are out there from researchers, policymakers, um, some of the good work of tech companies, and more to try to come up with a portfolio of actionable solutions that might make a dent in the problem. So um, the commission, uh, a bundled of the recommendations around three priorities, reducing harms, increasing transparency, and building trust. So um, I don't know that we have time to go through all of them, but I'll, I'll just mention, for example, um, in the category of increasing transparency, those included recommendations um, uh, about uh, protections for researchers and journalists to access data through online uh, platforms um, um, and um, enabling and empowering and frankly enforcing uh, tech, tech platforms to provide that uh, non um, personally identifiable public data uh, for study to understand some of the roots of um, how, uh, how content travels and how harmful content is being targeted. Um, some of the other recommendations in specifically, again, about increasing transparency are um, uh, include recommendation to require platforms to publish information about high reach content, including the account reach and impression data. Uh, also another recommendation that would require platforms to disclose their content moderation policies and practices and share a limited time archive of content that's been taken down because of those policies. And just one more in this category, and I'm happy to go through all of them I, I, if we have time, um, is about ad transparency. This requires platforms to disclose information about all paid ads and paid uh, promoted posts 
on um, their platform. This would help us identify which communities are being targeted by whom and with which content. So that gives you a little bit of a taste. And if we have time, I, I'm happy to talk about some of the other uh, recommendations. Thank you so much, Vivian. You know, one of the uh, series of recommendations in the report uh, is targeted at the media, recognizing that the media are both uh, a standalone field, but also, you know, deeply implicated in how information circulates online, what information circulates online, et cetera. And I want to turn now to Craig Newmark, who is perhaps most famous for creating Craigslist. Uh, which has, in some cases, been linked to the decline in uh, classified advertising and the economic structures that underpin journalism. But on the other hand, you're also the founder of Craig Newmark Philanthropies, and you have uh, put your money where your mouth is, one might say, in terms of supporting journalism. Uh, I understand that you know, you're very interested in some of the antidotes to the information disorder that we've just heard Vivian talk about, including some of the proposed solutions. What do you see as kind of the biggest two or three challenges that we're facing right now in democratic countries as lawmakers and the media try to grapple with the challenge um, of the technologically mediated information environment that we're in now, Craig? Well, first, uh, the effects of Craig's list on the media. I used to agree with you, but recently the uh, economists have done analyses and uh, briefly speaking, they tell me I'm flattering myself if I think Craigslist had much of an effect. TV news had much of that effect. And when it comes to the spread of disinformation in the US and across Western democracies, it appears that uh, TV news and other forms of mainstream news have been responsible for the amplification of disinformation. That's true also of news distributors like social media platforms, you know, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. So the problems have been that mainstream media and social media platforms have been amplifying the distribution of disinformation. And that's the biggest problem uh, that we have. When it comes to news media, or uh, the social media platforms, what seems to be the best course of action is to remind people in news media that they are amplifying disinformation, that they are practicing often something called both sidesism, and practicing also something called false equivalence, where they present one side of a story, which is actually purely disinformation. And I have a lot of faith in the people who work at uh, news outlets, and they tell me that they want to be reminded over and over again that what they're doing isn't ethical, it isn't trustworthy, and to help them present that to their management with the hope that their management will commit to trustworthy behavior. I'm working more intensely with people at social media platforms to do the same thing because they're pretty committed to stopping the flow of disinformation. They seem to have increasing strength in social media platforms, and that uh, strength is about to uh, increase in the near future. So I guess I'm speaking as a nerd who believes in people. I just keep working with people inside organizations, helping them do what they know is the right thing, I'm only committed to this to the next 20 years or as long as I live, and I will do so persistently. Thanks, Craig. Can you tell me what do you mean by that the power um, of these platforms is, is likely to increase? Uh... Uh, the power of the people who are working together, banding together to get their management to do the right thing is increasing. For example, as they reveal what's been going on, in social media, social media platforms and newspapers. Uh, very helpful to think about. I mean, to the point that these technologies are ultimately created by people and the platforms are, as governments are, composed of people who are doing their jobs and, and potentially trying to make the technology better. Um, with that, I, I want to turn to Barbara Bukov. Bukowska, excuse me, um, who is my colleague from Article 19. And as you know, it's kind of 
Craig is talking about the maybe the self-regulatory aspect of addressing some of these challenges, working from the inside out, you know, trying to have better practices internally, putting pressure um, by staff, by um, NGOs on the platforms uh, to do better. But at the same time, we're seeing that regulators and lawmakers around the world are also interested in forcing platforms to be better. Um, a lot of several of the recommendations in the uh, report that Vivian was involved in also have recommendations for lawmakers on how to put better safeguards and protections around social media platforms and other technology platforms. So, Barbara, what should we be thinking about as we figure out how we try to balance between uh, safeguarding and, and perhaps mandating greater transparency? Um, of these platforms while still protecting freedom of expression. I, I, I was muted, so sorry, hope you can edit it. Yes, thank you, thank you, Courtney. But you know, I want to, I, I will look at what we can do from the law or policy or kind of regulatory perspective in a way that it can safeguard freedom of expression. But I want to actually start with looking at the broader concepts we are discussing today, and even this, this concept of information disorder, because that presupposes the fact that we have had a system where order, the information was in perfect order, and everything was like, you know, great, and we, we are talking about post-truth as, as, as if we, as if we ha had ever had the, the period with truth. I don't know when it was, and also we are, we are working with these concepts which are not legal, they are messianic truth, and, you know, uh, and so on. And you know, so what we right, rather talk about is more uh, information ecosystem or the information evolution, right? Which has a lot of problems, and there are really problems, and there are real issues with disinformation or hate speech causes. But we really have here the evolution of the media, digital technology. We also have unfinished evolution of the traditional media or transformation of traditional media. And that's what, what uh, Craig was talking about, the uh, you know, polarization there, decline of the standards, media, broadcast media becoming more and more you know, polarized and bipartisan or partisan. And, and then at the same time, we have public who is expected to navigate in this really complicated information ecosystem. But then at the same time, we also have severe economic crisis, right? So we have uh, the, the crisis, market failures, inequality in a society, and that often the narrative is that it's disinformation which leads to polarized society, rather than looking at the fact that it might be, you know, economic causes that divide the society and the disinformation is then a symptom of the problems we have rather than the cause. So I think that should be the starting point for our discussions. And also that the human rights framework actually provides us with a framework for this, uh, this issue. And now like to your, to your question, what we can do from the law and regulation. So here I want to uh, highlight a few problems because the situation is really complex. And what do we see when we look at the governments and you know, international bodies that are trying to regulate the system, we actually often see that there is more, they are sending more political messages and want to show that something is done rather than investing really proper time to, to look at underlying, underlying causes of these this problems and really investing in finding the solutions which will be evidence-based and where we have really good, um, good, good background to think that they will really solve the problem at hand, right? Which they are not doing. So they are coming with this like partial laws, these very vague laws, they are trying to, you know, regulate certain content of speech or telling the companies you must remove this content very quickly and, and so on. And this then leads to, to very vague and overbroad legislation. And it also puts companies, not democratically elected institutions or courts or adjudicatory bodies who have tools and are actually responsible to interpret the law in making the decisions of what people can say and what they can't say online. But also on the other problem, on the other side, the states are actually not really looking at the, at the ecosystem in which these companies operate. Because if we look at the 
and those few companies we are talking about, because you know there is internet and, and then the digital companies are numerous, but when we look at the problems, it's really few of them, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and now like emerging ones. None of these problems with this information would exist if these companies did not have the majority of the planet on their platforms and they didn't have the business model, which they have at present. And that business model is based on personalization of data, personalization of the content, extraction of, uh, extraction of data, and locking people in those systems. So if we want to resolve the problem of disinformation, we can't be, or other problematic content as hate speech or terrorism and whatever, we must look beyond that content. We must look at the infrastructure in which these companies operate, address their dominance, address their business model, and to allow competitors and alternative players with better business model to enter to the market. And also to those big companies, and going back to what Craig said, that the self-regulation doesn't, doesn't work, it really do, does not work, and then they will not change the business model, and there they are made by the regulators to do so. And then we can look at what regulation we will have that will respect human rights and will be not detrimental to freedom of expression of all of us and to the society. Right. Well, I, I think it's really refreshing that, you know, finally in 2021, we are talking about the business models because I think that there have been, you know, people who have thought that the content moderation debate is somewhat of a, um, you know, an attention grabbing issue, but not really getting down to the fundamental issues that are at the root of many of the, the problems that we're talking about, the targeted advertising, the manipulation of emotions and sentiments. Vivian, um, in the report that, that you guys recently uh, released, there are some recommendations around targeted advertising. Um, but I want to ask you, you know, in light of what Barbara said, and also the fact that, you know, you worked at one of these, these companies, um, do you think that tweaks around the edges in terms of, say, greater transparency, in terms of rethinking the business model, uh, sorry, in terms of rethinking, targeting, um, advertising, transparency, et cetera, is that enough to really address the challenges that we're facing and protect freedom of expression? Or do we need to fundamentally rethink the business model of these large, you know, global trillion dollar platforms? Uh, we absolutely do. And, and, you know, our report gets, gets into that uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, the transparency recommendations are just part of the answer. They're absolutely necessary though, because we don't, if we can't understand, it, it's critical that we understand we as a society via researchers, via journalists have access to the data to understand how content, whether it's algorithmically targeted or that goes viral organically, um, how and why people respond to that. So, so I don't want to, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater by saying it's insufficient. Um, that said, the report does make um, uh, recommendations that have, um, you know, perhaps in your construct, um, a little more teeth. Um, for example, um, we have a recommendation in, in the United States. I don't want to go too down far, too far down this rabbit hole, but there is a much talked about on the, in, in the, in the corridors of power in Washington and in Silicon Valley and among um, people that study this space, something called uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, which is quite a mouthful. Um, and I won't go into all of the details about it because it would take too long. But the point is it gives um, uh, platforms, it also gives many other, uh, many other um, um, online businesses, including um, news organizations, immunity from the content that the users, for li immunity from liability for the content that users might post. And um, there's a lot uh, to be said about why that's important. And the commission does not recommend dispensing with Section 230, not by a long shot. However, um, Section 230 protections now extend beyond what was originally contemplated, considering it was developed and designed in 1996. So one of the recommendations um, of, the, um, of this commission is to say, the moment a piece of user-generated content is amplified um, uh, using ad tools uh, that are provided by the platforms, uh, it no longer has Section 230, uh, that, that, that the platform no longer has immunity um, or, or, or liability from that piece of contact. And further, uh, that if that the platform's 
algorithms or its other technology products um, uh, to the extent those also amplify harmful uh, information are also uh, not um, that that the platform should not enjoy Section 230 protection. So if implemented, that would go a long way. It will both protect freedom of expression, which is important to every society around, around the world and is particularly um, enshrined in, in the United States in the, in the First Amendment, um, but also um, removes liability from, um, the, removes the profit motive for that harmful, what started as free expression for it being sort of weaponized and targeted at communities to try to manipulate them. I, really fascinating addition, I think, to the conversation around Section 230 and the broader issue of when intermediaries should uh, experience liability or not. And, you know, one of the aspects, I think, of, of thinking about that and one of the differences, of, you know, while there are some similarities um, with news organizations, there are also differences in that, you know, one of the things that defines journalism are professional norms and standards and, and that those are created by journalists and news organizations themselves in uh, free countries and democratic countries. And you know, today, when we think about kind of news integrity and trust, we also need to think about that in the technological environment. Um, you know, and so I, and I think about that in relationship to 230 because it would seem that that might be part of, of how we think about uh, responsibility. But, you know, let me turn to Craig because you mentioned, you know, journalistic standards, the role of the mainstream media, um, at, or not just the mainstream media, but kind of traditional media um, in, the, in the information ecosystem. There are a lot of interesting kind of news integrity initiatives, how to, you know, indicate trust online. Can you talk about some of those, the ones you think most interesting or promising and how that might offer kind of a self-regulatory approach to addressing some of these problems? There are two paths, I think, to this end. There are a number of centers of uh, journalistic ethics, like at the Columbia Journalism School, Hawaiian Institute, the Markla Center, who are helping us better understand what are the ethics of greatest interest in the news today, like the fact that it's uh, considered wrong to uh, bear false witness, that is to amplify disinformation or to practice both sidesism. The other path has to do with getting the support of news organizations across the world, getting them to commit to uh, codes of ethics with some enforcement. Uh, two worldwide efforts, and I think we need more than one. There's Reporters Without Borders based in Paris they have the Journalism Trust Initiative, which is signing up news outlets across the world to commit to codes of ethics which, which encourage trustworthy behavior and then uh, have enforcement regarding uh, untrustworthy behavior. The Trust Project in the uh, US, uh, a project unto itself, is doing similar things with a more focused approach on codes of ethics and enforcement. Right now, the enforcement mechanisms for the trust project are being put in place with the Journalism Trust Initiative just falling a little bit behind. The idea is that if a news outlet or news distributor wants to be considered trustworthy, they would commit to the principles of the Journalism Trust Initiative or the trust project and subject themselves to uh, compliance requirements and if it turns out that they're not being honest with people, they can be called out. So these are things that are genuinely happening. Um, they are in process and accelerating. I'm pretty glad that there's two of them because the more uh, targets there are out there for bad actors who practice this information, life is harder for them if there's too many targets to go after. Uh, this is a kind of self-regulation I'd like to believe there's a role for regulatory bodies and governments, but I do know in the US, the environment is probably uh, too toxic for them to make uh, much progress. And I am aware also of, uh, of countries elsewhere where uh, bad actors have taken full control. So there's probably no hope for this kind of thing. And, and how, so 
how does that though translate in the techno technologically mediated information environment where you can be the most ethical news organization, have the best journalism ever, but if the algorithms don't amplify that content and make that content visible, if it gets drowned out through coordinated online harassment, how, do, how, how are these, are these initiatives dealing with that? And if so, how? Well, um, I do know what uh, happens uh, in some of the biggest social media platforms. The problem is that they do have people who are really good at ferreting out inauthentic uh, sources of information. They're pretty good at identifying who are the uh, disinformation super spreaders. The problem is that the uh, social media platforms don't do the easy part when they know who's uh, attacking uh, the US or any other Western democracy. For reasons unknown, they just refuse to uh, take action. Uh, typically, yeah, the social media platforms know who, uh, know who is uh, spreading disinformation. They've tuned their algorithms to amplify the spread of that disinformation. But for reasons which I really don't understand, they make things worse by tuning their algorithms to spread disinformation. Why? Uh, I don't know. You'd have to talk to someone who like knows human social behavior. And I'm a nerd. It's like, uh, have you met me? <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Well, with that, I want to go to Vivian because, you know, you worked at Twitter. Um, you were the head of global news. Hence, I would assume that you would like to have had news amplified over disinformation. You know, what Craig's saying, does that, does that ring true? And, and when you think about, say, some of these new, you know, news integrity initiatives and trust initiatives, can those, are those part of the answer for tech platforms? Well, they certainly can be. I mean, one of the objectives um, of both the, uh, 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 the Journalism Trust Initiative and the, the, and the Trust Project, sorry, they do, the names do tend to conflate a little bit, um, but they're both distinct projects going for the same aim. The, for both of those, as well as um, other um, similar efforts, is that the data that uh, that 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 the data of the uh, around, uh, about those news organizations who are accredited becomes a signal um, to the platforms in terms of what kind of uh, posts are are amplified or uh, appear higher up in your newsfeed. So that's um, so that's one of the uh, that's certainly one of the um, uh, objectives. Um, I was in Twitter, it was 2014. So honestly, that may have been, you know, uh, 1814 um, in, in tech years, things were uh, quite different, uh, quite different then. So I'm not sure how useful that is. But certainly the reason that I became part of Twitter is because I uh, saw its it, it what it was and how it had much greater potential to be a provider of high quality um, news and information. There are a lot of problems with Twitter today. Um, that said, I think if you compare their content moderation practices, at least they're probably doing better than most. And in turn, you know, you also have a, a very long career working with some of the best news outlets um, in the United States, if not the world, which are really fundamental pillars of democracy. How, do you think that news organizations, you know, okay, New York Times maybe is, is in a different category, um, than most, but you know, can journalism compete in this en environment? You know, it, is it possible to even have sustainable journalism anymore? Do we need to, you know, really figure out how to rebalance power? Do you think? Uh, well, uh, a, a lot of news organizations are. Uh, sorry for all the wind. <laughs> I've been I've been exiled to outside as I'm as I'm traveling for um, Thanksgiving holidays with my with my family. Um, so uh, uh, first of all, we have to try. There's no democracy without journalism. Period. Full stop. So uh, new uh, business models for news organizations are highly challenged. Yes, the New York Times and a few others are an exception, but at the local level, which is absolutely critical given um, uh, decades of uh, consumer uh, research that shows people trust their local news organizations more than they trust this uh, artificial abstraction called the media. Um, 
as as local news it has been hit uh, worse than just about any other uh, form of news, it's critical that we find new ways to support news organizations to be able to bolster their their ranks to provide that critical local information that people will trust. First of all, when there is no local news, that void is filled with um, all kinds of noise and garbage that might appear on a Facebook, uh, a private Facebook news group or on Nextdoor or on what are what are been now being called pink slime sites, uh, which are basically basically that means these are uh, highly partisan um, publishers spewing information not based in fact masquerading as local uh, local news and so without high quality news um, the void is filled with garbage second uh, local politicians local businesses and and any other potential um, wrongdoers are not held accountable and also it it harms a uh, uh, community cohesion we li we live in a time of unprecedented polarization um, if we can't stitch communities back together which news organizations can can help do then um, we're in a world of hurt indeed and if we think about um, the challenges that the united states is facing you know in many ways they're potentially even more acute in places that have not had as robust of an independent pluralistic media system you know democracies that are um, more challenged that are smaller economic base or or new democracies, you know, thinking about Afghanistan before the Taliban retook power or Myanmar before the military coup there. You know, we they don't have the same power to influence platform policy. They don't have the same um, powerful, you know, media institutions, lots of these, you know, these countries are are still developing that pillar. Um, Barbara, given the challenges uh, that you know many democracies are facing, do we need to think about um, imposing more legal requirements on tech platforms? You know, we know that Facebook has been linked with genocide in Myanmar. We saw how um, the Taliban in Afghanistan leveraged social media as part of their you know, overtake of power there. We're seeing that now in Sudan as well. So is it enough to, to wait, you know, to, to let the media and, and tech platforms kind of do their own thing? Or do we need lawmakers to step in in democracies like the United States or Europe where these firms are based in order to protect democracy elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Well, we already have these uh, initiatives uh, happening in the democratic countries. So like in the, in the European Union, we have this proposal, the Digital Services Act and Digital uh, Markets Act, which is looking at the platform regulation and the obligation that can be imposed on them on, uh, on by the regulators. But I think that we need a board of cautions and also with this, uh, the fact that we are here talking about the democracy summit, but I agree with what Vivian said about the problems in the media and how the void is filled with you know, a lot of garbage, but I wouldn't be taking this brush stroke for whole world because we also have the countries where we don't have free media at all, right? When the media are controlled by the government, where independent investigative journalism can't be officially functioning or doesn't have an access to this official. Outlets. And we don't even have to go as far as you said, uh, Courtney, to Afghanistan. We can go to Poland or Hungary, like Poland. All the, all the local press was recently purchased by the government a conglomerate, actually the uh, electricity company or energy company. So and for them, the social media are the way to report independently and get this information to the news, right? So when you talk about the regulation, you also need to think of what are the democratic institutions in the country, whether we have independent courts, whether we have independent institution, independent regulators, and whether the legislation, which might be okay, or might be, um, might be solving some of the problems, let's say in the EU, how this will be applied in some of these other parts of the world, or copycat when we don't take these other issues uh, into consideration. But also what was said by, by Vivian and Craig before, we also have to talk about, and again, we are at the democracy summit, that this is not just about what individual users or bad media are doing. 
a lot of this information or hard information is actually coming from the state actors or from their proxies, right? And this is not new because this existed during the, the, during the Cold War and so on. But now the states obviously applies the new technologies to, uh, to, to spread the propaganda even to their domestic population, but also internationally. And this is really the threat to democracy, that this is the threat to state sovereignty and you know, human rights protection. But that aspect is, will probably not be solved by you know, human rights framework, because this is about the state's relations and you know, geopolitics and so on. And in the past, during the Cold War, the OSCE, there was a discussion about some you know, treaties about the, how we are going to use that is, you know, propaganda wars and have some rules. So maybe there needs to be some discussion about as well and start, start coming to some sort of a truce or, or agreement what, what they can do. But when we are talking about the, about the companies within the states and what content they remove for the users, we, we need to have transparency, we need to have accountability, but we also need to make sure that the regulation, if it's imposed on them, is not captured by those different state interests and commercial interests, because then that will be detrimental to freedom of speech. A giant challenge to prevent capture by private and governmental interests, no doubt. Um, but that said, I think, you know, it, it's interesting to hear, um, I, I think taking kind of the, the global perspective and, you know, I wanna go back to you, Craig, because you mentioned the role that individuals in these technology firms are playing. And, you know, much of what we do know about the role that uh, several major social media platforms have played in the information ecosystem is because of leaks from, from employees, because of research that was done internally and then leaked, um, you know, whether that's the troll networks in Azerbaijan and Turkey, um, or again, some of the other examples I mentioned. I guess I would ask you, you know, as, as we are in the lead up to the Summit for Democracy and President Biden is gathering together heads of state from around the world, including, for example, um, President Duterte of the Philippines, um, who, of course, is presiding over a, a you know, uh, ent a, a mechanism that is, that is putting Maria Ressa, one of the world's leading journalists and the winner of one of the winners of this year's Nobel Peace Prize, um, you know, facing up to 100 years in jail, is, I, I want to put the same question to, you know, is it enough um, to rely on, you know, the goodwill of employees and the, the tech platforms themselves, or do we need strong democracies to step in and, and put in place some of the safeguards that will protect those in more fragile democracies or non-democracies? Okay. Uh, there's multiple parts there. Um, I think government should help out, but in many countries, including the US, uh, the environments are too toxic, I think, for government intervention. Uh, people smarter than me say there are ways that it can happen, but I'd have to uh, defer to them. What I do feel is based on my own experience, my own success over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, basically any of the success has been by accidentally being in the right time at the right place. And in my attempt to uh, simulate normal so social behavior and my simulation of social skills, I've worked with a lot of people in technology companies, <coughs> in newspapers and so on, and just regular everyday people. And whatever, the only thing that ever seems to work is to relentlessly remind people to nudge them in a more productive direction. That's actually worked for me again over the last 20 or 30 years. It is the history of Craigslist. And for that matter, it's the uh, history of much of the, uh, the United States. So uh, I would hope that government intervention could help, but maybe not in these uh, trying times. Meanwhile, I am beginning to have some success with people in the background, in news, and more to the point, in social media platforms among my fellow nerds. It just means I have to be persistent. It means I have to keep working with people and just never, ever stop. 
We definitely cannot stop, especially since uh, this is airing just two days before the Democracy Summit kicks off. And we know that there has been a whirlwind of preparations and that there will be some announcements about various uh, commitments that will be made. Uh, we understand that that is likely to come from the states themselves, and there will be another summit next year in person uh, where we'll see how those states do. So as we wrap up this session, I'd like to just ask each of our panelists briefly, what would you like to see, you know, one or two commitments coming out of the summit from these invitees who are, you know, most of them so-called democracies, <laughs> um, some living up to the term better than others. What are the commitments that you'd like to see them make with respect to protecting freedom of expression um, and technology? Uh, Vivian, I'm going to start with you and then Craig and then Barbara. Sure. Um, you know, I, I could name about 50 different things, but I just want to pick one that I feel like we haven't spent enough um, time on, which is freedom of the press aside from put, put the platforms aside for a second freedom of the press is under um incredible risk increasing risk around the world we talked about what's happening in the philippines with duterte and maria ressa um we are seeing it now in um many of the former eastern bloc countries um uh russia belarus um hungary um poland is under threat turkey Brazil, um, uh, some of the Central American countries like like Nicaragua, some of the you know bubbling up while not at the same level we saw under the Trump administration of the United States, and on and on and on. And I would like to see um, uh, strong um, universal uh, support for um, press freedom and including um, some form of having some teeth for those that do not um, allow or enable a free press. Uh, that sounds great. I'd love to see some teeth as well. Uh, Craig, on to you. Uh, I don't know a lot about how the uh, world works in general. I just know uh, one smart thing that is that as the US government and others become smarter at fighting disinformation, and smarter at protecting our company vis-a-vis -vis cybersecurity, that the agencies which do this get the active involvement right now of those uh, entities in the US who are really good at uh, respecting the wishes of uh, embodied in the Bill of Rights of the founders of our country. They need to remember that we have things like due process and the rights of the accused. They need to remember that uh, you're innocent until proven guilty. And they need to seriously think about how the Bill of Rights interacts with matters like encryption and backdoors. The concrete suggestion that I've already made in Washington is incorporate the smartest of the online rights groups like the EFF, EPIC, CDT, get them in the tent now because I think they'll help protect our country, the US, in terms of what the founders intended as expressed in the Bill of Rights. We always have to. Craig, I think you just hit mute uh, as you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to remember that there's always, we have to protect the, the rights encoded in the Bill of Rights, the rights of the accused, due process, and the notion that you're innocent until proven guilty. Well, that would be something that it would be amazing if all of the countries and the leaders coming to the Democracy Summit could commit to that, since that's certainly not the case uh, with Maria yes. Ross and, and so many of the other countries there. I, I got so excited about it. As you saw, I muted myself. <laughs> well, thank you. Barbara, I want to turn to you for the last comment. What would you like to see coming out of the Democracy Summit? So I think that we actually, uh, to just to recapitulate the, the problem is that actually what our discussion shows is that we have a very difficult task at hand because uh, I think the problem can be summarized with uh, the sentence that some people want uh, the companies to protect us from the government and then some government, some people want the governments to protect us from the company. So it's really a conundrum which we have and it will not be easy to come to the solution. But I think that the, the summit is uh, uh, more broader than digital technology. 
safety. And to what I said at the very beginning is that we really need to see these issues in their complexity. And we really need a commitment to solving these underlying social causes, which we have in the society to address inequality, to address the independence of the institutions, rule of law, and, and so on. Because any of the problems we have with the companies will not be solved if we don't address those underlying problems. But also we need a recommitment to the freedom of expression standards, which the governments often conveniently forget. And also that the commitment to freedom of expression doesn't involve only re re restraining themselves and not to like arrest journalists and so on, but also create this you know, conducive and enabling environment for freedom of expression, for different voices to flourish, but also for different types of the media. And given the, the problems we have in the media environment, and you know, as I said, lack of independence, but also challenges to, 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 uh, to small media outlets and this dominance, to, to have um, different types of support to global in civil society and journalism through uh, helping them to sustain their work and also supporting alternative business model, which will be alternative to this extractive businesses, but also which will enable to people and you know, communities to access the information they need. And then we also need a transparency, not just from the companies, but also transparency from the government. So transparency over their actions, access to information, and clear communication from the states uh, over their actions and over their policies. So media, civil society, and citizens can also scrutinize their governments. So that would be my hope that the Global Democracy Summit commits to or recommits to these, these standards. Thank you, Barbara. Um, obviously, we can't just choose one when there are so many things that we really need to come out of this democracy summit. And, uh, you know, I want to thank our panelists and maybe I'll just add my two cents here. I'd like to see a doubling down from the government to provide better access to information and not require journalists to always go through FOIA, because when you have better information uh, that will make journalism better, that information will then be available in lieu of the disinformation that circulates so easily. And I think that we are seeing, at least um, in the Biden administration, some reaction um, in terms of appointments to the FTC and the FCC uh, recognition that there is an issue with the business model. And so hopefully we'll see a commitment to some of the recommendations that came out of the Information Disorder Com uh, Commission report as well as commitments to engage with civil society, as Craig said. Um, and so with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you on behalf of Article 19, which works internationally and domestically to promote freedom of expression and access to information and protect all of our human rights. So with that, thank you so much for joining us today. Um,